Hi, I'm Noe Montez, and I'm the chair of the Department of Theater, Dance, and Performance Studies. Uh, what you'll hear today is uh, a part of a lecture I give in the first week of my contemporary U.S. theater class. And what that class does is take a look at trends in the contemporary U.S. theater over the past 10 years to think about how the, the economics of producing theater work, to think about how the theater is engaged in issues representing class, race, gender, uh, and to uh, consider some of the challenges of staging theater in the contemporary moment. Uh, so what I'm going to talk about today is uh, the economics of producing a show on Broadway using Hamilton as my uh, case study. Um, let me start with a tiny bit of audience participation. Uh, just call it out. When I say Broadway, what's the first thing that comes to mind? Just say it. Show. Cats, show, theater, uh, anything else? Musical. Musical. All of this is great. And now, when we think about Broadway, we sort of think about it as the center of the theatrical universe, at least here in the United States. And it's an important reminder when I talk to my students and they're looking at Broadway that what we're thinking about is here's the United States as a whole and if we scroll in doo -doo -doo, now we're getting into the Northeast United States getting a little closer you can see New York State closer still And finally, here we are, when we, when we talk about the center of the theatrical universe in the United States, what we're really talking about is 42 theaters in a roughly 10 block by 3 block radius. Uh, that's something that's a term that's actually union codified. So uh, the notion of a Broadway theater is a union term that encompasses all theaters that seat more than 500 people in midtown Manhattan. Uh, and don't get me wrong, well, there, there's some very impressive work that happens here, but it isn't the entirety of the U.S. theater landscape. So what I want to do is to have us think about what Broadway is and how it's distinct from the rest of the U.S. theater industry, to, to learn a little bit more about who goes to Broadway shows, and then to talk a little bit more about the economics of Broadway and how things work. These are my learning objectives, just so that you see them in case you're a visual learner. And let's dive in. So, except for Broadway and uh, the, the touring productions that spring from Broadway, almost all theater in the United States is not for profit. Broadway functions as commercial theater. Now, uh, if I were to ask, does it, can anyone provide with like a sentence distinction of how they understand the commercial theater industry versus a not-for-profit theater industry? And it's okay if nobody knows. Yeah, go ahead. It's something which you make money out of, right? That's a uh, profit one. And the non-profit is like you just run the organization uh, so that you don't make money out of it, you don't take money out of it. Yeah, I, I think that's, a, that's a, a great synopsis. So a commercial theater, which Broadway is, is typically formed as a partnership or company to produce one play and disband. And it's bought into by a pool of investors uh, who, uh, one, uh, rent a theater space in Midtown Manhattan, one of 43 Broadway theaters. Two, uh, sign an agreement to run that show for as long as it's profitable. And three, uh, are looking to reap the investments of the success of the show. Uh, we'll get to this in a little while, but uh, investing in a Broadway show is oftentimes a terrible, terrible idea. Um, fortunately, losses are tax deductible for the most part. <laughs> Uh, whereas a non-for-profit theater, which is what 99% of the theaters in the United States are, a theater organization plans a slate of plays as part of their season with a goal of year-to-year -year sustainability and uh, perpetuity. Um, uh, usually uh, the shows in a season have set open and closed dates, although they can extend by a week or two in many instances. Uh, they rely on partially box office, but predominantly donations, grants, donor support, uh, similar to a university in that sense. Uh, 
and uh, the income, any profit generated by the show goes into the endowment with the goals of sustaining the institution, again, in perpetuity. So, let's turn to Broadway and start to think a little bit more about who goes. So, over the past 30 years, we can see that the attendance for a Broadway show has grown quite considerably uh, from about a low of six and a half million people in the 1985-1986 season to nearly 15 million people a year now. Um, approximately 35 percent of the people who go to see Broadway shows live in New York City or the tri-state area. But what that means is that 65 percent of people who go to see Broadway shows uh, come in from outside of the tri-state area, uh, maybe families vacationing from across the country, or increasingly audiences coming from outside of the U.S. I think last year, uh, or in 2018-2019, the last year that there was sustainable data about this, uh, something like 19 percent of people who went to see a Broadway show came from a country outside of the United States. Something else that I think is interesting are the gender dynamics. Who goes to see a Broadway show? Uh, you know, the U.S. population is about evenly split, 51-49, uh, female-male, but 68% of the people who walk through a Broadway playhouse are women and 31% are men. So when we start to ask ourselves why Broadway produces the things that it does, what's successful on Broadway, this is part of the consideration that we have to keep in mind, uh, that you know, this is part of the audience that they're playing for. Additionally, if we look at the age of people who go to see a Broadway show, the average age of a Broadway audience member is 42.3 years of age. Um, and even within the distinction between musicals and plays on Broadway, there's a gap still. So the average age of somebody who goes to see a musical is 41.2 years, whereas the average age of someone who goes to see a play is a uh, higher 47.2 years of age. Now, you know, uh, there are lots of reasons why there's such a small percentage of, you know, under 18 relative to the U.S. population. Um, you know, uh, Broadway shows are expensive, as we'll talk about in just a moment. I'll get to your question in just a second. Uh, the shows start at 8 and can oftentimes run till 11, so it's not the most kid-friendly audience time, and there are travel logistics too. Yeah, go ahead. I'm sorry, I'm just looking at your chart, and I don't understand what audience census is. Uh, so, this is the percentage of the audience relative to their place in the U.S. Census. So, if 24% of the U.S. population is under 18, uh, you, and it was sort of demographically equal, you would see 12% of Broadway audiences, or 24% of Broadway audiences being under 18. But instead, it's 12%. So that's where the 50% comes from. So you know, you can see percentage-wise the 25 to 34 group uh, and the 50 to 64 group are. Uh, the sort of two biggest in terms of index. And, you know, uh, again, uh, thinking about price considerations, the average ticket price on Broadway now is just a hair under $150. Um, uh, and many of the shows, including Hamilton, have starting ticket prices that are much higher than that. Next, uh, I want to talk about uh, race and ethnicity in relation to going to see Broadway shows. So what we can see pretty clearly is that 74 percent of the people who go to see Broadway shows are white, which is a higher percentage than uh, the U.S. population as a whole, uh, and where there's a lack of representation comparatively are among uh, Hispanic or Latino folks or black folks uh, who have a much smaller audience share on Broadway than they do inside of the U.S. population. And again, I mention that only so that we consider what sort of shows are being seen on Broadway and why there aren't a lot of shows that uh, necessarily speak to uh, audiences of people of color. Next, I want to turn to education. Uh, 
So uh, Broadway audiences are by and large much more highly educated than the rest of the United States. 81% um, of Broadway audiences have a college degree and 41% have some sort of advanced education, be it a, uh, some, uh, going to graduate school, holding an MA, MFA, PhD. Uh, if we compare musicals to plays, again, the number of people who go to a play are even more highly educated. 91% of people who go to see a play on Broadway have uh, an undergraduate degree of some sort, and 51% have an advanced degree, uh, 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 an adva yeah, as opposed to 80% and 39% if we're just looking at musical theater. And then the last thing that I want to mention is the uh, average household income of people who go to see a Broadway show. So the average household income in the United States uh, is somewhere in the ballpark of about $75,000 a year. Anyone want to take a guess of what the average household income is of somebody who goes to see a Broadway show? 200, 150. 120, um, 261 thousand dollars a year. That's average or median? Uh, that is average. Um, and so, uh, you know, again, uh, when we talk about Broadway, when we ask ourselves, and this is one of the questions that informs this first session of the class. Why are there so many big Disney spectacles? Why are there so many uh, revivals of shows that we've already seen? Why are there so many uh, shows that seem to rely on big fancy sets and lights as opposed to, to, to uh, sort of uh, plot-based storytelling? You know, we have to keep in mind that the Broadway audience is a very specific entity that is unlike any audience for any of the major regional theaters or community theaters in the United States. It is a richer, wider, higher, higher educated um, uh, audience that uh, is comprised of people coming from all over the United States with the very specific intention of seeing a show that is going to be worth the hundred and fifty dollars or higher in most instances uh, that they're paying to get in. And so, you know, again, uh, I, I, knowing this helps us use Broadway as a counterpoint to the rest of what's happening in the U.S. theater industry and uh, as a way for us to understand why the work being produced on Broadway is so different from what's happening on other stages in the country. So now, let's turn to the money part. How do the economics of Broadway work? So, a Broadway show starts when somebody thinks that they've got a great idea, and I'm going to emphasize the thinks that they have a great idea part. And, well, step one is thinking that you've got a, a great idea. Step two is finding an incredible amount of money. Uh, on, and part of the reason why it's so hard to find the incredible amount of money that it takes to stage a show on Broadway is because of the fact that Broadway, as I mentioned before, is a really terrible investment. So for those of you who are parents in the room, if you have kids who one day tell you, you know, I think I'd like to throw my life savings into producing a Broadway show, I don't want you to discourage them because I work in the theater, but uh, there might be better life choices. 80% of Broadway productions struggle, uh, fail to recoup their investments. And part of the reason is because, unlike movies, they can't be scaled globally. Uh, at best, a Broadway show is performed eight times a week in a theater ranging from 500 people to about 1,700 people, creating really big supply and demand issues. So, Hamilton, for instance, plays at the Richard Rogers Theater in Midtown Manhattan with a seating capacity of 1,300 people. At its peak in 2016 and 2017, even with the highest ticket prices priced at just a hair over $1,000, there weren't enough seats available to meet the demand. So, going back to the money, producers have a great idea, they're trying to find the money, if they can't provide it themselves, to, re to uh, help stage the show. Uh, 
Uh, producers start to hustle to get capital from investors. Uh, typically, a person might buy a share of a Broadway show for a price point starting somewhere between twenty-five and fifty thousand um, uh, dollars, similar to shares of stock. Many of those investors are theater fans. Some people are folks who like to speculate wildly on markets and think that it's a good deal. But ultimately, the average price of a play on Broadway is about five million dollars. That's what has to be raised as sort of the initial capital to get something staged. And for a musical, it can be twenty million dollars. Uh, famously, for uh, the uh, Spider-Man musical that flopped so disastrously on Broadway about ten years ago now, the upfront capitalization cost was seventy-four million dollars. Uh, I, I know, uh, and if you saw that musical, uh, you, A, you're one of the very few people who did, uh, and B, uh, you may realize very quickly that was not worth that $74 million investment. And that's just to get it up on its feet. The expenses add up every time a show is performed, and those operating costs can range up to $900,000, a million dollars a week to support everything from keeping lights on to paying the actors, etc. I'll talk about that a little bit more specifically in just a moment. Hamilton has a weekly operating budget of $938,000 and it costs $12.5 million as an initial capitalization cost to uh, mount the musical. But six months after its 2015 debut, it was able to recoup its investment because Hamilton was pulling in about $1.5 million a week, so earning about $600,000 a week in profit, uh, which makes it an incredibly rare success story within the world of Broadway. And so now, let's talk about where that money comes from. One, on Broadway, just making that $1.5 million a week over the course of a 50-week run, uh, we get to about $100 million a year uh, on Broadway. In 2019, for instance, it was grossing about $1.9 million a week in ticket sales. Wicked was the first sh fastest show to gross a billion dollars in profits, and it was able to do that in 12 years. There's some thought that uh, uh, there was some thought prior to COVID-19 that Hamilton would have easily bested that record and was on pace to do so, uh, but of course COVID-19 uh, affected the theater industry so widely that it is no longer on pace to get that $1 billion in 12 years, although it's going to make its billion dollars eventually. But that's just on Broadway. Uh, some of you may know, some of you may have even seen that B Hamilton is touring widely across the United States. And this is the real way that Broadway shows make money through their touring industries. Hamilton has set up uh, productions in Chicago, on the West Coast, in London, and on top of that, there are touring companies that travel to Boston, Atlanta, Houston, you know, your sort of major cities in the United States. And it's estimated that each tour of Hamilton uh, makes 80 million. So if you've got three or four tours of Hamilton happening simultaneously in the United States and a tour happening in London and eventually a tour happening in Asia, you're looking at about $400 million a year of income coming in uh, just from the touring productions. And then there's sweet merch. If you've got to get that I'm young, scrappy, and hungry t-shirt at the top right, or if you want your Hamilton shot glass that you have to pay $15 for, you are contributing to a $15 million industry, a year industry just on Broadway. This is just information coming from the Broadway shop. Uh, if you go buy uh, uh, merchandise at some of the other stops, you're contributing to even more uh, revenue for the company. And one of the side effects is that this doesn't just bleed into Hamilton, but it bleeds into other places. Um, uh, I, want, uh, I believe that the uh, Ron Chernow book on Hamilton that was the inspiration for Lin-Manuel Miranda's writing of the musical has made something like an additional two and a half million dollars 
since the show opened, just from ticket sales generated, or uh, just from enthusiasm generated by people who bought tickets to the production. So the cost of producing the show in New York is 34 million a year. If it's making 100 million, that's 68 mil uh, 66 million dollars of profit. And then the cost of each touring production is about 30 to 40 million dollars a year. So if they're making 80 million, that's about 40 million dollars of profit for each touring show. So where does all of that sweet, sweet profit go? Uh, let's start with the producers. And again, audience participation question. If I were to ask you to guess how much of a cut of the profits the producer pool got as a whole, what might you guess? 50, 80, is that a five? Five, five, ten. Eighty-two point five percent of the profit. This is Jeffrey Seiler, who is the lead producer for Hamilton. He alone gets a sweet, sweet forty-two percent of the profits, uh, which is uh, a good deal if you can get it. Lynn manuel Miranda. Get, in comparison, gets 5% of the, the profit. Uh, and Lynn is a particularly rare case because Lynn wrote the lyrics, he wrote the book to the musical, he wrote the music. Uh, otherwise, that 5% might be getting split up between three, four people, etc. Now, other good things that Lynn has going for him is that he gets his actor's salary, or he did while he was performing on Broadway. And he, he is the sole owner of the royalties of the show. So that means that when Hamilton stops touring and you, know, you go to see your kid in Tufts University's production of Hamilton, probably somewhere in the year 2032, or your high school's production of Hamilton sometime in the year 2037, uh, that Lin-Manuel Miranda will still be breaking in royalty money. And I'm going to guess that for every high school production or college production, uh, that's going to be somewhere in the ballpark of 500 bucks. You multiply that by several hundred multiple times a year, uh, over multiple years, and that's, that's, that's still a pretty good deal. He's not going to be hurting uh, because of Hamilton, not to mention all of the stuff that he's doing for Disney. Additionally, the public theater, which was Hamilton's home before it moved to Broadway, the sort of place where the musical was uh, workshopped and developed in a pre-Broadway run, uh, holds about 5% of the profit coming in from Hamilton. And this is typical when a theater goes in on a, to, to help workshop a Broadway production. Uh, they'll, they'll take some percentage of the cut, typically about 5 to 7%. Uh, so for those of you who live here in Greater Boston, uh, ART down in Cambridge does this a lot. They uh, do pre-Broadway runs of shows that the director Diane Paulus then proceeds to take to Broadway. The most recent example is the 1776 production that's happening on Broadway. Uh, ART stands to make about 5% of the profit from 1776. Uh, and this can really help support, this is a way that nonprofits work in partnership with commercial theaters and can really support the long-term mission of a non-profit theater because at least in the public theater's sake, all of that Hamilton money is going directly into the theater's endowment. <laughs> Lin-Manuel Miranda's dad gets one of the sweetest deals I know. Luis Miranda, as part of any contract that Lynn Manuel N Miranda negotiates, gets 1% of the profits of the show just for being Lynn Manuel's daddy. Uh, so, uh, so, you know, if you do have people who, uh, if you do have kids who decide to uh, <laughs> produce work on Broadway, you might want to mention that in the future, just in case you yourself can reap 1% of uh, what's going to be a billion dollar in, uh, investment. Ron Chernow, who wrote the Hamilton book, has a stake in the Hamilton profits since it was inspired by his product. So he gets a clean 1% of all of the profits that take place. Uh, this is rare, but the original cast typically doesn't get any share of uh, profits of, uh, you know, they just get their salaries. Uh, but in the case of Hamilton, the, the company collectively bargained 
so that every member of the original cast has a split of a one percent stake in the profits of Hamilton uh, so long as it runs on Broadway and in touring companies. Um, given that an actor on Broadway so uh, makes somewhere in the ballpark of if you're a chorus dancer, about 2,000 a week. Uh, if you're one of the leading people, maybe closer to 10,000 a week. That, and there's no guarantee of you know, uh, the sustainability of an actor's life, in, uh, of an actor's working career. Uh, this is going to turn out to be a very lucrative deal, especially for the chorus folks who are in that show. Last, uh, choreographer Andy Blankenbuehler Music director Alex Lacamoire in the middle and director Tommy Kale each have a cut of the profit. Uh, Blankenbuehler's choreographer gets 5%, Lacamoire 1%, and Tommy Kale, who was the director of this, uh, as well as In the Heights, uh, and who is a good friend uh, dating back to college of Lynn Manuel Miranda, gets 1.5%. The original lighting, scenic, and costume designers also have a half uh, percentage stake each. So that's what the profit looks like in the U.S. theater industry. Um, the last thing that I would note is of the $900,000 that Hamilton costs to produce every week, somewhere in the ballpark of $300,000 to 400,000 of that, these numbers are a little bit secretive, go to the people who own the theater themselves. So Broadway has 44 theaters that consist of, you know, uh, that have earned the designation Broadway. Of those 44 theaters, three companies, uh, I always forget, J-U-J-A-C-Y-M, uh, uh, yes. Uh, the Schubert Organization and the Niederlander Organization, they own 31 of those 41, uh, of those 40 plus theaters. And because you have long running plays like Phantom, like The Lion King, like Wicked, like The Book of Mormon, that means there are only about 25 theaters up for grabs, 25 Broadway theaters up for grabs every year. And so, the, the, those three corporations truly do make an incredible amount of profit. It's one of the biggest hustles in the uh, Broadway game. So uh, rather than investing in a Broadway play, I might recommend that you invest in a theater that houses a Broadway play since that's really where the money is at. So I use this as one of my foundational lectures, one of the very first lectures in my contemporary U.S. theater class because uh, I want students to see how the commercial industry works and when they ask why aren't Broadway shows doing m more progressive things, why aren't they really speaking to the social or political issues that are affecting the United States, I want them to understand that Broadway is a very specific industry. It's a commercial industry looking to enrich the lives of its shareholders, its theater owners, and the people who work on its productions. But that is just a tiny percentage of what happens in the U.S. theater industry. And if you were in my class, over the next 15 weeks, what we would do is take a look at the regional theaters across the United States. Uh, take a look at community theaters, uh, theaters that cater to ethnically specific audiences, and really understand what's happening in the not-for-profit world in contrast to what's happening on Broadway, so that you could have the clearest sense of what the industry as a whole looks like. Uh, we're a really robust industry, and this is one of the great times for young playwrights. Um, you might not always know that if you just looked at Broadway, but it is helpful to have it as that counterpoint to understanding part of the fuller picture. I think that's the end of my slideshow, so thanks for your time, and I think we've got about five minutes I can take some questions with. I'll walk around with a microphone. Go ahead, please. Quick question is, do, do the producers get that share because they put in most of the money? Yes, I, I, I mean, that's, that, that, that's precisely it, you know, uh, and I don't want to begrudge the producer. Somebody has to put in the, you know, 20 million, or in Hamilton's case, 12 and a half million that it, stakes cost, that it costs 
to stake a musical. Uh, but yes, that's why they get such a huge percentage of the profit. Yeah, Thanks go. Thanks for um, that engaging talk. How do the demographics of the Broadway audience compare to not-for-profit theater, um, including symphony, opera, and small regional theater? Uh, so I don't have the numbers for a symphony and opera, uh, but uh, as a whole, uh, regional theater audiences tend to be uh, more diverse. So if the number was, uh, I forget, let me look here, 60 uh, or 74 percent uh, white on Broadway, uh, the number is closer to about 65, 64 percent white for the major regional theaters across the United States. The per household uh, income is uh, about 134 thousand dollars a year, which is still twice more or less of what the household income is as an average in the nation, but much lower than what's on Broadway. Uh, uh, and in terms of age, it's about the same, uh, somewhere in the mid-40s as a uh, typical audience share. Uh, the gender breakdown is uh, also quite identical. Typically, regional theater audiences are about 65% uh, women and about 35% men. So uh, where there's the biggest differences are in sort of uh, race, ethnicity, and household income. Yeah, go ahead, please. So now that Hamilton is a huge hit, it's, it's easy to see that that's kind of representative. It started as the exact opposite of what you say succeeds. It was an original piece done by an ethnically diverse audience mm -hmm. in a musical style that really had not had any place on Broadway. And so with your students, how do you frame that then as an opportunity or a possibility to bring what they have to the masses if it isn't a jukebox musical or a revival? So that becomes the actual next lesson that, uh, <laughs> that follows this. And what's, what's great is that, uh, you know, uh, we can talk about how Hamilton is working structurally, the way that uh, Lin-Manuel Miranda has, uh, to my mind, a sort of unique voice uh, at infusing like hip-hop and contemporary pop stylings into what people think about as the musical theater sound. Uh, and uh, so, uh, you know, we, we can talk, so, so, as part of the way of looking at why Hamilton is such an outlier comparable to the rest of Broadway, it's uh, looking, uh, thinking about sound, uh, thinking about uh, the sort of buzz that he's, he's generated, uh, particularly by like uh, creating a relationship between the show and the Obama presidency, uh, where like the first time that anyone heard any part of the musical was at a performance that Lin-Manuel Miranda gave at a White House event. And even as uh, Obama was leaving office, one of the sort of farewell things that happened was a concert for him from the cast of Hamilton. Um, so, so that sort of like uh, savvy of trying to make those comparisons so that Hamilton uh, felt like it was of a very particular moment. And also thinking about how the theater industry is changing. Uh, um, despite the, or, although the numbers look uh, incredibly white, incredibly affluent still, the theater is becoming increasingly diverse in its audience share. If I were to show you those numbers from 20 years ago, it would be closer to 85% white audiences on Broadway. Uh, so Hamilton is a sort of a uniquely told voice by someone who I think is a musical theater visionary. Two, came about at like the right political moment to align itself with what was happening in the country. And three, is sort of the torchbearer of a shift that is slowly but surely starting to happen uh, among Broadway audiences. Wow, one extra question. So I wanted to build on this last question because I see your point about the nonprofit theaters have two jobs. First, it's lifting up underrepresented voices, but it's also a chance to test out new concepts before, like with the ARC, they go to Broadway. Have you seen a relationship between those shows that have been tested out first and then move to Broadway are more successful and thereby become sort of a risk reduction for those producers hesitant to invest in something that uh, is off the beaten path.
unfortunately, no. About 80% of the plays that come from regional theaters to Broadway end up failing to recoup their investment also. There's, uh, it, it would be lovely. Investors would love me if I could say there's one particular trend that can tell you what leads to a successful Broadway show. Uh, there, there just isn't. All right. Well, I think we're at time. Thank you so much for being here.